some ways, Siri Hustved, we, we could put um, today's meeting under the sign of Aristotle. Aristotle, interestingly enough, said, excellence is never an accident. It is always a result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives. Choice not chance determines your destiny. Yeah, it's a big one. It's a big one. Um, it's a big one, of course, because um, it, it's really a question of will. And this continues to be an enormous intellectual debate in both the natural sciences and the humanities. What does it mean to have will? Do we have free will? But I can say it's also a debate in Kierkegaard's studies, because choosing, and this was something that didn't come out in the, in the first conversation, is that this endless possibility that you and Pascal Bruckner were talking about is, of course, for Kierkegaard, framed in a subjunctive space, philosophically. It means that y y everything is possible. And the moment you make a choice, the moment you choose, you actually ground yourself elsewhere. And so you possibilities, and you exactly. So the possibilities vanish. Now this is, you know, also a kind of practical reality. You know, once you've decided on the door, uh, then those the two other doors that were potentially open are no longer open. So so that's simple. What's not simple <laughs> yeah, is awesome. what's not at all simple yeah. is whether. Uh, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard, is talking about something that is cognitive and willed in the way that scientists talk about free will or not. I think not. Huh? Explain this a bit. I think because you that he's not backgrounds. talking about this kind of rational, highly cognitive choosing among possibilities. He is talking about an inward reality that has as much to do with uh, the imagination and feeling with an emotional state as it has to do with some intellectualization or cognitive state. There are arguments about this. I mean, there are Kierkegaard scholars who say that there is this kind of high volitional impulse in Kierkegaard, I choose, I decide, and others who say, no, 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 it's more complicated than so that. So what do you think? I think... I mean, you, you have actually spent some time with Kierkegaard scholars recently. <laughs> yes, well, no, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow I'm giving a lecture at the Kierkegaard Research Center, and that's a conference There'll be a for lot his. of scholars, yeah. There will be, as Kierkegaard himself would say, a lot of professors and assistant professors, all working out details of Kierkegaard's writing. And once you enter the secondary material, you realize that nobody All agrees. All I can say is God bless them. God bless them, exactly. Um, but I think what is interesting um, from maybe a lay point of view, the unscholarly, unprofessorial point of view, uh, is that in Kierkegaard, he does not uh, make reason the top of the hierarchy. But. And that's important because, of course, the history of, of Western philosophy has been mind over body, uh, intellect or reason over emotion. And Kierkegaard really does away with that. And he makes, I think I have a quote. Quote I, of mania. I, I'm not the only one allowed to No, quote. no, no. no. I, okay. This is... And the other thing we have to say, and this is a, we're not just talking about Kierkegaard here. 
we're talking about his pseudonyms as well. So I want to make a distinction. This is Climacus by, by, in by the postscript. Mean, by that you mean other personas Kierkegaard Other took. personas that he called in one place in the um, point of view of my work as an author, he called them foster sons. That he was the foster so, father so he may to not these have guys. Had children, but he had many. And he denies that one word written by the pseudonyms was written by him. So that's important to keep in mind. So this is Climacus. Thinking is, is superior to feeling and imagination. This is expounded by a thinker who himself has neither pathos nor passion. It is didactically expounded that thinking is superior to irony and humor. And this is didactically expounded by a thinker who totally lacks all sense of the comic. How comic. It's really wonderful. It's really wonderful. It's really wonderful. Can, uh, can I, can, uh, can I, <laughs> yes. since you quote it, I want to quote it. Okay, too. please, let's you do quote, a back and forth. I, we'll okay. do a back and forth. I yes. will quote from the concluding unscientific postscript. That's it, that my, was mine my too. My pseudonymity and polonymity has not had an accidental basis in my person. Right. but an essential basis in the production itself, which for the sake of the lines of the psychologically varied differences of the individualities poetically required an indiscriminateness with regard to good and evil, broken-heartedness and gaiety, despair and overconfidence, <laughs> suffering and elation, <laughs> and then to give us a little break, Kierkegaard writes, etc. What has been? <laughs> you see, he is funny. He I is mean, funny. He is no, this no, no. Is he really is important. funny. He's Are really you? funny. Take my word yes. for it. Take okay. our word. Our for word. It. We agree. He is funny. I mean, yeah. not funny. immediately, but he is funny. <laughs> What has been written then is mine, but only in so far as I, by the means of audible lines, have placed the life view of the creating poetically actual individuality in his mouth. For my relation is even more remote than that of a poet who poeticizes characters and yet in the preface is himself the author. Yeah. That is, I am impersonally here it's yes, a bit like yeah, what this is it. Pascal yeah. says. Yeah. He immediately takes away what he's just given us. I don't know where Pascal is, there. but there. Yeah. Okay. Pascal, this I is am, for you. Yes, I am impersonal. Okay, you probably know it by yes, heart. Keep going. Pascal, c'est pour toi. That is, I am impersonally or personally in the third person as a souffleur, souffleur. a prompter, you know, under yeah. the theater who has poetically produced the authors whose prefaces in turn are their productions, as their names are also. Thus, in the pseudonymous books there is not a single word by me. <laughs> I have no opinion about them, except as a third party, no knowledge of their meaning, except as a reader, not the remotest private relation to them, since it is impossible to have that to a doubly reflected communication. My role is a joint of being the secretary and quite ironically the dialectically repudiated, re reduplicated author or the author or the, of the authors. But on the other hand, I am very literally and directly the author of, for example, the unbuilding discourses up, and up. of every other word up in them. My upbuilding, good. yeah. Upbuilding. Yeah, exactly. Well, upbuilding. This is well, of course. So you're so correcting me because you have read all of this in Danish. No, this is, I wanted to correct that earlier statement. Yeah. I have read mostly Kierkegaard in English, but I have checked the Danish. I find it quite hard. To, to, to read Kierkegaard in Danish. So we are lucky. So, um, so I can at least compare. You know, I, it's like I can have the so double he's text. So he's harder to read in Danish. For me he is because although I read Norwegian, which is very similar, you know, this is 19th century Danish, and I can, I mean, f for example, interesting words like uh, Kierkegaard uh, distinguishes, it's distinguished in English between existence an actuality, and in Danish, um, actuality, I think, is virkelighed, which we would think of as reality. Huh? 
Sounds so, really German, like so it, it, it is like wir Wirklichkeit. It's the this same the Germanic word root. I understand. That's right. So now, yes, and actually there are more. With your German, you would understand more. But anyway, no. So I want to disavow any expertise in on the Danish text. I have simply checked back and forth. Yeah. Well, but yeah, this statement, the statement on pseudonyms, yes. pseudonyms <laughs> really interest you. They do, they, but uh, yes. But in a particular yes. context. For well, I think, first of all, um, this comes back to the dandy Christ in a way that you know, we can spin a little further, which is that Kierkegaard also wanted to live his pseudonymity as a dandy for the residents of Copenhagen. So the idea of the dandy, and he uses the French word flaneur, the flaneur, was incognito for the religious interior. Is this making sense to you guys? But it's making a lot of sense. A, okay. it, 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 yes. ma it, it makes me think that he's a, a true precursor of Baudelaire in that way. Well, I think um, that this, this is... Uh, or, or compatriots, right. um, but rather. But in fact, I think uh, what he keeps saying and what Climacus in the postscript says, I am a humorist. Huh? And then he says, but humor is an incognito. In other words, you can't look at a person and know what's going on in the deep, silent, faithful interior. And um, another place you have the knight of faith who looks just like a tax collector. So this is important. So the dandy, what is the dandy? It's an aesthetic, external being, you know, in Kierkegaard. Because I was and then about there's a religious interior. There is yeah. a posturing. There's a posturing, and the pseudonymity is part of this posturing, and one irony on top of another. So the maddening, bewildering, crazy-making part of reading Kierkegaard is that, um, as Pascal was saying, it's completely dialectical, but the dialectic can move so quickly that you think you're following, and then you realize you've been had. You've been, I, I, I must say, <laughs> I, you, have described, you have described my last months. Yes, well... I mean, this, I, yes. I feel like uh, j'étais vu, yes, I've really been had. And, and, um, and I attributed part of this just to growing old. No, I think actually we do in some way become more sophisticated readers as we get older, at least I think I have. Oh, good. Um, but, but, oh, good because but, I, but that has not, that has made me only potentially uh, become more alert to that sense of being had. I mean, ah, his, oh, okay. you know, his, so, yes, his uh, Magistergrad, yeah. a, a, a treatise, which is on the concept of irony, and he talks a lot about Socrates. The first time I read this, it's many, many years ago. I was about a third of the way through, and suddenly I realized that he was being ir ironic about irony and turning the ironies. I was so annoyed, I was so irritated that I threw the book across the room. And then later, reading a biography, I discovered that that is exactly how the committee who was reading that text felt. They were very annoyed. Um, and of course they gave it to him, he was a brilliant young scholar, um, but they found it to be a highly irritating text and, and Kierkegaard can be highly irritating and I think it's important to, there's a little sadism in him. Hmm? In reading him. Absolutely. But in him also. I think in his relation to the reader. To, I mean, I'm to just, the beloved reader. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm interested in your relationship. I mean, as as a writer, <laughs> as a yes. writer, you're interested in your reader. V deeply and, interested in my reader. Yeah. And you address in in many many of your books. No, I've, only in one, that one. Well, in this one, you I do. You immediately I address. address the reader. Yes, I address the reader. It's, a, it's an 18th century, it, you know, it, it goes back sure, to the 18th sure. century Sure, fielding English, and, so. and so many yes. others. But you address the reader, and here the reader is addressed in, by Kierkegaard 
to frustrate him in some way. I think so. I, I think so. Even though he, you know, there, I think that Kierkegaard is a dialogical writer. There is um, always an I and a you. I mean, Martin Buber has an, a very interesting essay about about Kierkegaard's, uh, you know, relationship to the thou. Um, and the reader is one of those others. I think there are three. There's Regina, who's also a reader, especially in the earlier works. Um, there's the reader, the beloved reader, and God. That's it. God is the reader. The big one. Um, no, the, the, the big other. You know, it's yeah. funny because um, I, I, it, it feels so strange to correct a, a writer about his or her own assertion. And I felt that in your essay... Oh, you're right. In, in the essays I do address the reader, you're right. Okay, because... Ah, uh, he got me. You're absolutely right. I forgot. Yep. Oh, good. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad we set the, the record straight. Because um, I felt... Sorry. I felt, no, but I felt very addressed um, as mm -hmm. a reader. Um, and you were speaking right. to me yes. and really wanting to know uh, that you were present. And I, w I was wondering, you know, how much of this had in, in, in effect, um, had an effect on you through Kierkegaard. I mean, you mentioned, and you know, how much effect Kierkegaard altogether had. I, I don't think there's so many novelists today, or essayists for that matter, who freely or pleasurably or willfully wantingly address, um, the reader, uh, yeah. address the reader and address the reader and quote as you do indeed quite often I mean one here is one of the, one of the quotations from the summer without men uh, she's sane again and she's in the birders living room reading a biography of that coy but passionate genius the Danish philosopher who has been irking and upsetting and <laughs> bewildering her for years yeah. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, what that relationship was for you with Kierkegaard, who I believe your paternal grandfather read greatly. That's right. And My, he, read, yes. he read nearly nothing else but Kierkegaard. So is it in your DNA? Are you, are you, are you carrying around what... I don't what know. This, yeah, it's, this is this. My mother's... Um Father, my mother told me this, he died during the occupation in Norway in 1943, so I never knew the man. She said, of, of course, not until I got older did I understand how strange this was. But my mother told me that her father only read Kierkegaard and church history. Mamma mia. And I said to my mother at one point, Mom, did he read them as oppositional texts? My mother had no idea, of course. So I have no idea if, if he was establishing some dialectical reading patterns himself or, or what. I have no idea. But also when I was a little girl growing up outside of Northfield, Minnesota, across the creek from where I lived were Edna and Howard Hong, that Danish people great, don't have to know, great, but great they were the translators of, of Kierkegaard. Not um, only, but also of Pessoa. Didn't they translate Pessoa? You know, I this think. I do not know. Okay, I think so. Who is really? I think so. Because and that from, interests from, me. No, I don't think that they it's spoke not possible. Portuguese. I don't okay. think so. Would but be a nice story because I, I think of Pessoa and the heteronyms. And I do too. Yeah. I think okay, about Pessoa yeah. too. I, no, no, I just, I, yes. it, it interests anyway, me in terms of the Hongs yeah. were were, were translating no. Kierkegaard yeah. throughout my whole childhood, and I remember going um, visiting them um, as a child and their children, and there was this big stack of papers where Edna Hong was deliberately and laborious, laboriously translating one work of Kierkegaard after another. So, yes, Kierkegaard haunted my, my childhood. And um, when I was 15, I took fear and trembling off the shelf in, my, in the library in my house and read it. Uh, and what because happened? I liked the title. It was the first time. And the cover um, in Penguin now is something yeah, else. Yes, and the thing is, it was God. the. F well, that's great. I mean, Actually, that's very really appropriate. I think that's appropriate. It is appropriate. Yeah. No, it was the first time I that think I read anyone that. had taken. S that I had read a writer who took seriously the horrifying story about Abraham and Isaac. 
And so even though I didn't understand his ironies, I clearly did not understand the philosophical references. I understood the feeling. Either Abraham is a criminal and a monster, or there's something else going on. I mean, he posits this. Uh, it's not Kierkegaard again, but it's Johannes de Silentio. Um, Go, will you, will read you re something. And I just, I'd love you to, to read a, a passage. Of, I'll read one and then you read okay, one. Okay, you read one and I'll uh, read okay. one, yeah. Um, what I intend now is to extract from the story of Abraham its dialectical element in the form of problemata in mm. order to see how monstrous, uh, that's something I would have liked to talk yeah. also with, yeah. with, ah, we just don't have enough time. <laughs> Go, on. Go for it. Keep how keep paradox on. faces, a paradox capable of making a murder into a holy act while pleasing to God, a paradox which gives Isaac back to Abraham, which no thought can grasp because faith begins precisely where thinking leaves off. Yes, and then this yes. little passage, if you can read this little passage and then turn to this little passage <laughs> okay. here. All right. Just read, read it. both of them. It will, okay. it, it will give an idea of, yes. of, of you as a 15 year old. Yes, Let, yes. Let's imagine. Yeah. For faith is just this paradox that the single individual is higher than the universal, though in such a way, be it noted, that the movement is repeated. That is, that having been in the universal, the single individual now sets himself apart as the particular above the universal. If that is not faith, then Abraham is done for and faith has never existed in the world just because it has always existed. Wow. Wow. So there's paradox for you. The paradox, of course, is that he, Kierkegaard never wants or never argues that faith is rational or that any proof can be made. There is no proof. It is absurd. It is an ultimate par uh, paradox. And to try to turn it into a rational system, as Pascal was saying, very much in the postscript, or any kind of idealist, philosophical, Hegelian apparatus is impossible. And that returns us to the single individual uh, subjectivity as truth. Okay, here. Faith is the highest passion in a human being. Many in every generation may not come that far but none comes further. Then there's a, a, a break, and here you have. But life has tasks enough, even for one who fails to come as far as faith. And when he loves these honestly, life won't be a waste either, even if it can never compare with that of those who had a sense of the highest and grasped it. Pretty incredible, huh? Yeah, no, he, I mean, I, mean, I think, again, he writes so beautifully, and he writes with such urgency and meaning. And this is why I would like to take a slight issue with what was said earlier. Please. Which is that it is true that Kierkegaard frames himself continually, and I mean as a father of the pseudonyms, too, as a souffleur, as someone who stands in the side, as an observer, but at the same time, the greatest joy and vigor and living and experience for him was in the act of writing itself. Writing is also lived experience. Huh? It is subjunctive, as he says. It does, you know, there's all kinds of possibility in it. But I disagree about the sacrifice. The joy he got from writing was immense. Now, this is not... This is me looking at Kierkegaard, not Kierkegaard's self-interpretation, because he says there's far too much of the subjunctive in me. You know, the if, he doesn't say the if, but he says there's far too much of the subjunctive in me. Would that I had some indicative power. It's beautiful. That's, That's what Pascal Bruckner was saying. Fantastic, but yeah. you know, I do hear in you, Siri, a plea. Yes, a plea. A real plea. I mean, you, 
you are, you are channeling Kierkegaard, but I think you're talking about, you say it with such vigor and vitality <laughs> and passion yes. that I feel that you might be talking about writing for you. Yes, I, I, I think this is true. And I mean, you know, yes, I and mean, Kierkegaard says he isn't, that, his, that writing for him is a need. He does not frame his own productivity as a, as a choice. He frames it as a need and an urge, and then, even more complex, he thinks of himself as God's souffleur. So that the pleasure but, we derive from reading him is also a pleasure he got by doing the work. Yes, and that he, and this is very important, he feels that he is being written. Hmm? So he's it's really not, le porte-parole. I write, but I am written. And, and, you know, before he knows what the next line is, it's there. Now, this, I have to say, for me, is not at all framed as a religious experience. It's framed as, for me, there are moments in writing any text where the text seems to be writing itself. Huh? So, uh, obviously, unconscious, subliminal, Forces are, are at work, and the text just appears or feels as if it is making itself, and that there's no, um, you know, no director. I can see a book. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. No, I know, I know. no it, this, is, this is actually, there are many, um, uh, uh, I'm not alone, and Kierkegaard was not alone. It's, a, it's an experience that recurs. Um, uh, Milos, uh, the, uh, the Milos. poet, exactly. He said, I've often wondered who that demon was who wrote my poems. Uh, and the same experience. Nietzsche had a very, very similar experience. Um, what was he writing? The Gay Science, maybe? He talks about lightning striking and the words just appearing before him. But you know, in that way, it contradicts um, what Pascal was saying about him not living. Yes, well, um, that's why I, mean, I wanted to... Pascal cannot I, defend himself here, so it's kind of pleasurable. I know, to, it's kind of... But, to, no, to, but, I th but no, in, I mean, in he's, some sense, it's, yes. it's different because um, what you're saying is that writing was an activity. It actually wasn't a not doing. That it's, it lived, was not a, it's lived experience. It's lived experience of yes. a certain nature. Of a certain kind. And just to reinforce uh, uh, Pascal for one, one moment, too, I mean, uh, uh, Kierkegaard did say, it's somewhere in the journals, he said, um, you know, the, the, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact quote. You know, the great misfortune of my life has been that I was unable to attach myself to another. To? Another. Another to human To another being. human being, you know. So obviously what Pascal is talking about is also true. Well, it, yes, yes, because other yes. people matter. So I mean, body I'm, and yeah. flesh matters. It, I mean, it, it's, it does. It, yeah. And, and, and so what I'm saying is that maybe I'm making my own dialectical response to something that is true with another truth. Well, I, I, think Small you, I, I think you're giving value to something that may, it may seem, as with Emily Dickinson or other writers, yes. that you know, the, the written life is not a full life. Right, and I, I think Dickinson is a great example, and actually I've thought of her often well, in relation she, to Kierkegaard. She comes, she comes up naturally, yes. um, one would imagine. Um, I could think I could think of others, and uh, you know, particularly at the library, we have such extraordinary archives of Virginia Woolf. Yes, and she's another. Yes. Uh, one day, if you come to New York, you you must see these these archives, including the walking stick with which she went into I the know, ocean the and committed suicide. Yeah. Um, it's uh, anyway. Why that digression? I don't know. But she, there is um, there is yeah. this, there is this moment. You know, it, it happens to me all the time. Since I'm a bunch of quotations, there's a wonderful line of uh, Tristram Shandy who says that that digression is a sunshine of narrative. Um, in in um, in either or, 
the judge writes the following, for me the instant of choice is very serious, not so much on account of the rigorous cogitation involved in weighing the alternatives, yes. not on account of the multiplicity of thoughts which attach themselves to every link in the chain, but rather because there is danger afoot, danger that the next instant it may not be equally in my power to choose. Right. I wonder how right. you understand that. To well, me, this is it, well. This essential. is it's a, again. I think this is, of course, it's very, very Kierkegaardian. It's also very Judge, you know, William, who I've always found to be just a little bit of a dull guy. Yeah. And so you realize that that this particular voice inside either or um, is not a fully religious. Uh, a, a voice. He's not. Um, he d really does not represent Kierkegaard entirely. But the question of choice is really important. Huh? And um, so he's saying, the moment comes. I mean, the idea of the moment is huge in Kierkegaard. Right? It's that it presents itself, and if you miss it, you've missed it. You can completely miss it. It's not as if um, um, it's necessarily always there. I mean, he says there's somewhere, I have another quote about the self, and it's about choosing. It's a wonderful thing because it's a highly sexual metaphor. Um, by the individual's intercourse with himself, this is also from part two of either or, he impregnates himself and brings himself to birth. That's quite something, huh? Can you re <laughs> just, just, just repeat that? I asked Pascal to by, repeat that. By the individual's intercourse with himself, he impregnates himself and brings himself to birth. So the idea is that through, you know, a self, uh, reflective self-consciousness, you know, it is a, you know, growing up in development, you, there's a moment comes where we have reflective self-consciousness. It's a very Hegelian idea. The person can have this dialogue with him or herself, herself too, and through that, the self is born. So in either or, there, there's a feeling that the aesthetes really don't even have selves yet. The self well, they is have mil born they have from the choice. They have thousands of. They have endless possibility, but that, but it's the moment of choosing, in this you know, uh, intercourse with yourself, this uh, internal dialogue, if you will, that a choice, some kind of choice, is made. Again, I don't think it's necessarily fully conscious or cognitive, but some motion happens, and then the self is born. I mean, the, the, uh, no, I think. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. the anxiety of missing the moment is tremendous. Yes, yes. And uh, I mean, the, the, the choices we have in life not to make choices are tremendous. Yes, yes. I mean, it's daunting. And, it's and, uh, daunting because, um, you know, Pascal was speaking about the vitality of failure. I mean, this is the vitality of failure of your own life. Yes, yes, of, and I think he, he went back and forth. You know, he, he also regretted his decision not to marry Regina. Um, regretted she, and, is and, a slight and, word, yeah. Well, back yes, but then, at the, you know, back and forth, forth back and, and forth, back and forth, and whether to publish under his own name or not under his own name. I mean, there's tremendous back and forth in Kierkegaard, and in fact, it is also in the travesties of form that are part of the Kierkegaardian pseudonymous oeuvre, right? So the forms are mirroring the, um, the philosophy in some way. You know, there, there is a, when I, when I came here um, in, in early September for the first time to, to Copenhagen, I met an, a number of Kierkegaard specialists and I mean, they all know an enormous amount about Kierkegaard and I know a very small amount. I always say that I approach my 
my subjects with the euphoria of ignorance. But there was one line mm. that I very much love in Kierkegaard that has haunted me. You were talking about haunted, and I think we are haunted by lines. We carry yes, them around. Yes, yes. And there's one that I've always loved, and I, I wonder how you would react to it. I'd love you to explain to me what it means for you, and it might then, using quotation as a mask or a shield or a protection, I might be able to understand myself what it means. But right. it's been with me for... A long time. I won't reveal how okay. old I am, but for a long time. <laughs> and he, Kierkegaard somewhere says, more or less, haven't been able to find yeah. the line, but yeah. it's nearly that, because I've yeah. read permutations of it. But this is more or less how I remember it, which matters okay. itself. He says it that the goal is to arrive at immediacy after reflection. Yes, yes. Well, it's, you know, the idea of immediacy. I mean, there, there's a beautiful thing in a fragment that Kierkegaard said, says that um, language is the ideal. And he says, without language, man would remain in immediacy. So immediacy, I think, is an embodied here and now in which reflection is, is impossible. The contradiction is that human beings have both self-reflective abstract possibilities and this embodied here and now immediacy. And I think in why, Kierkegaard... Why are, you, why are you making this gesture? Because he talks about a contradiction. Uh, and so I, you know, I always see yeah, these sort of uh, yeah. visual ways of looking at it. And that... This inherent co contradiction between the abstract and, uh, and the concrete is Kierkegaardian philosophy, so that human beings who have reflected and reflected choose a new form of immediacy, which for Kierkegaard is this inner and silent, speechless domain of faith. That's it's the new immediacy, silence. I think. I, I believe that so that's what it is. So a childlike. Yes, and in, as he says, and also, interestingly enough, dependent. So that that very difficult Kind of a, second, a, second, a secondary immediacy. An that's immediate, right. Because in, in a sense, we are all... I was going to use foul language, but we are all doomed in some way because we have we've bitten on the apple. Oh, yes. I mean, in the concept of anxiety or uh, angst, yeah. this is, you know, he's trying to relate the individual experience of sin, guilt, and anxiety to the universal collective notion of original sin. You know, the, the race, as he calls it, to the yeah. single individual. Because how do we arrive at, uh, yeah. at immediacy after reflection? I mean, what is the root? How can we, how can we experience, and maybe this will be yes. a, a subject uh, to speak about with René, how can we experience the here and now, the tactile, the pleasurable? Well, you know, in, if, in, yes. if we are constantly self-reflecting and yes. removing ourselves from the here and now, the tactile, the pleasurable, and what actually tastes good. But that's absolutely right. And the yeah. fact is, you know, poor, uh, poor Søren, he said that he was born reflective, which of course is an exaggeration. Slightly, but, he, but maybe but, only but slightly. But his feeling, yeah. his idea of his yeah. own childhood was that he was, he, I, he says, I had no immediacy. But he was doomed by, as we heard from Pascal S earlier, by his father reflective. also. Yes. His and of father, course, but his, yeah. his, his, interestingly enough, his father doomed him and his mother appears nowhere. How do you explain that? I think, I mean, this is completely speculative, but I think the mother joins the rank of, of silence in Kierkegaard that plays a huge role. In other words, what we have is endless numbers of words, 7,000 pages in the journals alone. And I think it's all turning around these silences, which he says is double. Silence for him is both uh, the ineffability, you know, the ineffable in faith and the demonic. 
So the mother occupies, I think, this place of silence, of the unspeakable. It's, and, it's, and mothers it's, are so interesting in that. I mean, mothers are very interesting. Well, we were but in mothers our mothers. Because they, they, we learn to speak from them. We, we, we learn to speak from them, but also, I think it's also the, the fact um, that we are inside. And then there's no separation. There's no um, abstraction, no symbolic cut, to use the little French theory. In, in um, oof, there was so much to say. Um, in, in slowly closing, not too quickly, I know time is running out, but what can we do? Um, uh, in the Summer Without Men, you have this line. In his journals, Kierkegaard writes that dread is an attraction, and he is right. Dread is a lure, lure, and I could feel it tug, but why? What had I actually seen or heard that created the mild but definite pull in me? Perception is never passive. We are, on, we are not only receivers of the world, we also actively produce it. This, there is a hallucinatory quality to all perceptions, and illusions are easy to create. Even you, dear reader, <laughs> can easily persuade it that a rubber arm is your own by, charming, by a charming neurologist with a few tricks either up his sleeves or in the pockets of his white coat. So, this about dread. Yes. Being a lure. Well, I think yeah, this little passage, of course, I realized after I published this book that, um, that not everybody understood all the ironies. But anyway, that's, that's a Kierkegaardian position because once you enter into the realm of irony, you have no idea who's going to receive it as ironic and who's going to receive well, it as straight. Well, because irony is partly a private language. Always, always. You know, this, it's a risk. Well, irony we, we is both, a risk. We both live in, in the United States. We do. And, <laughs> and I, actually in, in the same part of, 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 uh, of New York, uh, Brooklyn. And um, what was I going to say? Well, I, I got oh, I off know the what topic. I was going okay, to say. Go, no, 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 okay. you go, you go. Right. I know, I, I just remembered. I, but go. Yeah, no, I just, I, I think that this, that in the concept of, of, of um, anxiety, which is a maddening, dizzying, crazy making book, it really is. Um, I think he's enacting in the prose what the reader is supposed to feel. And in that text, you feel this um, attraction you know, repulsion. And the gestural or the mental images that Kierkegaard conjures in the reader, I think are very important to what we think of as the philosophical meanings. This is really not talked about. So it's an embodied, about. an embodied philosophy. It is, um, and, yes, yeah. and he has this idea of the mimical, yeah. which is like mime. So I think the mental images that the reader creates, and of course they'll be different depending on the reader, um, are vital to the experience of reading. Well, you know, yes. in, in uh, Living, Thinking, Looking, you have uh, this essay, which I really, I really love, called On Reading. Oh, right. And I've read so many essays on reading, and I must compliment you on that, on that one in particular. You say, philosophy usually does not stay with me in pictures, mm -hmm. but in words although I have formed images for Kierkegaard, for example, because he is a philosopher, novelist, a thinker, storyteller, I see Victor Ermita, the pseudonymous editor of Either Or, with his hatchet as he smashes the pieces of furniture in which two manuscripts, manuscripts have been hidden. Yeah. So he really, um, he, he's there. He's here. That's right. He's, and I think, you know, for um, in the um, academic work on, on, on Kierkegaard, this is often ignored, you know, that sort of novels are a little embarrassing or that, that there's, you know, what is he really saying? Well, part of what I think Kierkegaard and this, his pseudonymous perspectival beings are getting at is beyond the abstract concept. 
and it's living in these pictures, these mental pictures that he's working very hard as a philosopher slash novelist to and he's create. Left, and he's left traces. Yes. He is a you know, walking philosopher in Copenhagen. He's a peripatetic yeah. philosopher yeah. par excellence. Uh, par excellence. Yes. You, you, and we have all these, you know, the, this, this great library here has some of the most extraordinary, probably the most extraordinary archive. And there's so many drawings of Kierkegaard as a wanderer, as a yes. walker. Yes, yes. Um, I know what I was going to say about Brooklyn, but it wasn't about okay. Brooklyn. It was about America and irony. Oh, I've right. Lived uh, it's not a good subject, but it is a subject. But, it, it, you know, I've lived there for three decades, and I still cannot get over the fact that <laughs> when... Uh, it's a hyper-generalization, but when... Uh, uh, I was going to say countrymen, but I'm, I'm from no country, but when Americans want to be ironic, they will go like that. <laughs> and it just seems to me to... <laughs> to be the most <laughs> extraordinarily undoing of irony. Of course, of course, it's... it's I, I and, mean, it's the end, c'est la fin des haricots. Uh, of course, uh, of course, and it's, it's... I remember after September 11th, everyone was announcing the death of irony, and um, it was a horrible moment in New York, as I you know. Remember. But the, I, the, the thought that people should announce publicly that a form of double consciousness that, as far as I'm concerned, is necessary to, to existing yes. should be banned from American culture was so stupid that, you know, I really felt annoyed. I write an irritated, polemical essay just about yeah. every day in my head. I mean, I can't do that many essays, but, you know, the really angry letter to the editor? T say a few <laughs> words. A few words. <laughs> No, I mean, I think this is just, this is naivete about what human beings are to and such a, a of, huge a lack degree. Of confidence and, a, and a lack of confidence, and perhaps the result of a very short history, at least on the part of the white people who, who, who started the United States of America. Uh, but. And so Kierkegaard gives that's us, right. Kierkegaard gives Kierkegaard us in a way confidence is in he, understanding. That's um, right. I mean, in, in a way, reading Kierkegaard helps us understand the complexity of multiple languages. Kierkegaard is an antidote to all simple explanations about what it means to be human. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can I ask you one more thing? Yes. Um, just one, I, I know we're out just of time, one just question. one more thing. Um, it, it was a great ending, but, um, <laughs> I, 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 and I think in, in a way I'm maybe overstaying my welcome, but um, I, will, I, will, I will deal with Lisa later when she tells me, my goodness, you went over time. But um, you, you're so interested, Siri, in ambivalence. And I think ambivalence in the context of what you were talking about really is interesting. And I could read a long quotation from you on ambivalence, but rather than do that, it seems to me that ambivalence, as it fits both in your novelistic and essayistic work, somehow has its origin, maybe not origin, but has an inflection that comes from Kierkegaard. Yes, I think ambivalence is good, but it's actually ambiguity, and they're two different things. So okay. ambivalence is a kind of going back and correctly. forth. Ambiguity is when you really cannot identify what You're right. the it, thing it was, is. Uh, it was it's amb ambiguity. Coherence can, cannot eliminate ambiguity. However, ambiguity is not quite one thing, not quite the other. It won't fit into the pigeonhole, the neat box, the window frame, the encyclopedia. It is a formless object or feeling that can't be placed. Ambiguity asks, where is the border between this and that? And then it goes on to That's right. many other things. So um, I think that I am interested not in mush, not in ambiguity as mush as an intellectual concept, um, but I am interested in applying not one model to the same object, but multiple models. And out of that, I think you can get what I call focused zones of ambiguity. Now, there are two people, Simone de Beauvoir and 
uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who talk about ambiguity, uh, philosophical ambiguity in a very interesting way, who have had some influence on me. Merleau-Ponty was interested in science as well, uh, the natural sciences and neurology, as I am. Um, and uh, so I think ambiguity is a rich, not an impoverished concept. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it was Thank fun. You. That was good.